this is Starless. This podcast may contain language some listeners find offensive. It may also contain descriptions of a violent or sexual nature, as well as frequent descriptions of forest fires and their outcomes. Listener discretion is advised. Is this... I guess it's on. I don't know. There's no... Okay, um, I think this is recording. I, I'm sorry if my voice or my breathing sounds weird. I've been outside for a long time today, and there's a lot of smoke. So I'm wearing a mask, but it's very... Uh, let's just say it's not helping very much. And I'm sorry if there's weird outside sounds. I have no control over that. Sorry about that. So. All right. Uh, I'm going to try to recount the events of this day as best as I can before the power runs out on the recorder. I'm not able to go any place I would normally consider safe since I may be being followed for reasons that will make sense once I explain this weird fucking day. Uh, Nothing's really going to make sense unless I explain a little bit about my day-to-day, so I guess I'll just start there. I travel alone, mostly, because I didn't have a family at the time the fire started. I grew up in foster care and none of those families and I really clicked enough for me to continue my contact with them into adulthood. To be honest, it makes me a little sad. And I do wonder about them, the people I was close to. But I guess... I guess they were evacuated, and uh, I have no clue where they are now, or um, they're dead. But I was lucky enough to survive, so I usually spend the days wandering, scavenging for food and supplies like most people left on the ground. I already mentioned that I have an amazing place to call home after all that's taken place, but I also try to make sure no one notices it, since it's just too damn valuable to share. Uh, Emergency supplies and shelters have become overcrowded and pointless ages ago now, and it wasn't long before militias just took everything they could from them and moved along. So, if you need supplies, you're on your own. And today, I needed to find some kind of wrap for my leg. There's not a lot of cloth to go around these days. Sometimes I use ash to stop the chafing, but it's beyond that point now. And I've already torn what's left of my spare clothes to tatters trying to stop the pain. So I needed to find something. Something for it. I can't remember what I told you last time. I think I might have mentioned something about hospitals. I don't know. The smoke's kind of getting to my head. Uh, uh, We did have hospitals, but they were overwhelmed by demand and supplies dwindled until there was almost nothing left. There were lots of nurses and doctors that still showed up just to offer assistance, but I mean, I don't even know if they had soap and water at that point, let alone anything that would actually save a life. I have a sort of geographic area I stay in most of the time, you know, like close to home. It isn't densely populated since most people fled to the coastline, which is only a few hours away by car, of course. It's resource rich here and honestly didn't really even get hit by a lot of actual fire. It's 
more of a valley filled with smoke. But there are plentiful pharmacies to loot, lots of farmland, and an excellent water treatment facility still in operation, thanks to upgrades that made the backup power systems nearly incapable of failure, at least for now. I don't know how long it'll hold up, but there's plenty of fresh water in the river system that runs through it, and treatment tablets were one of my favorite things to hoard in the beginning. So I'm good. Uh, so while I was roaming around looking for something for my leg, there was this shuffling sound in the distance, like footsteps, but more tactical, less rhythmic. And there were so few people around here that I just found it really unnerving. And then suddenly a voice is shouting, hey, at me. And I'm thinking, what the fuck? Who the hell is out there? And I made my weapon visible, but tried to stay relaxed. This person obviously didn't have any intentions of ambushing me if they're yelling at me. This man, winded from running through the bush, asks me what I'm doing there and mentions something about being on patrol for several days. He was wearing full camo and was unnaturally clean. I didn't like it. Boots still had a shine to them. I should ask you the same thing, I replied in a tone that was probably more than a little snarky. Patrolling for who? He explained. They're with a small group. Two men, one woman, and three children. He told me he just wants to keep them safe. He said they're not militia, and they're non-hostile, just families. And then he said, you won't need that weapon, gesturing to my rifle. <laughs> Your getup makes you look a little hostile there, man, I quipped, leaving my weapon exactly where it was. This guy must have had it three guns I could actually see, and I had no idea what else they might be hiding. Then I asked in my toughest voice when they arrived since I know all the people that spend time in the area. He repeated it had just been two days which made me feel like an idiot and then he got to the part that really fucked me up saying they had to flee the city about 200 clicks away by foot. Hell of a walk he said but it's been overrun. Overrun by what? I retorted showing my inner skeptic. His voice, hushed to a whisper, took on a barely noticeable shake as he told me what the group had endured. Honestly, I, I don't know how to describe them. Looked like militia at first, but then we noticed behind the masks they had. <laughs> There's just something not right about them. It's in the eyes. They were setting more fires. Can you fucking believe that? more fires. They had fucking flamethrowers. They lit up anything that wasn't already burning, including citizens. We took a small group and left. We watched others head in different directions, but we have no means of communication. We don't know of any other survivors. I'm pretty certain I replied the only way a rational human being could. What the fuck? Did you notice anything else? Were you followed? I definitely grabbed my gun and scanned the scene to make sure I couldn't spot anyone. It felt like a setup. Everything was off just a tinge, you know? My leg was killing me and I needed to fix it. The pain was distracting. I knew I couldn't keep up the conversation much longer and watch my own back at the same time. Well, that's why I've been scouting. To ensure we weren't followed. I haven't seen any sign of those things yet, he responded. As for noticing anything, yeah. They ate the people they lit up. I asked him to clarify in what must have been a completely incredulous tone. This was not something normally talked about openly among strangers. They fucking eat them. I told you, he said, losing some of his composure. There's something not right about them. When their masks came off so they could eat, they had, they had fucking pointed teeth. I don't know if they filed them or what. Shit, these kids we got with us have nightmares every night. A couple of them haven't spoken since we left. What's your name? I asked him. Boise, 
he said. <laughs> Boise? Really? I replied. My face was likely wearing my disbelief. Don't blame me. Blame my mother, he said, and began leading me to his camp, telling me it was only about two clicks away. I asked him why he thought I was coming back to his camp with him. He said he had noticed me not put any weight on my leg and gestured to it. I silently raged at myself for being so obvious to strangers. I told him that unless he had bandages or cloth to spare, I was not going anywhere. By this point, I pretty much had enough of this guy put around in the chamber to drive the point home. He said they had the basics and reminded me I wouldn't need my weapon. Guess I can't blame him. I was basically annoyed enough to shoot this asshole. Fine, I said, more than a little frustrated to admit I needed help. Knowing the nearest drugstore to raid was more than the two clicks it would take to get to his camp. Let's head out. If you need to scout for supplies for your group, I've got some leads for you too. I'm Rana, by the way, I said, almost as a, a peace offering, I guess. It's nice to meet you, I guess, even though the world's a little bit too fucked up for anything to be nice. We walked that path to his camp in silence since I really didn't know how to feel about any of it, and I was trying to process. I decided it was wise to get all the info on the group I could, rather than ignore their presence. They could have a huge cache of weapons or food. On the walk, I couldn't help but have my thoughts wander to the children. They must be a huge liability, but at least it's their risk, not mine. Maybe the kids have never seen a book. Maybe I could get some work done. Having a purpose helps when the world's spinning out of control, I guess. Being able to share some history with someone who likely doesn't remember or didn't have the chance to even go to school before the world turned to shit is, to say the least, very inviting for me. It's honestly the only thing that's kept me sane these last four years. We arrived at the camp, and I had started to feel a little better since the hike had given me time to clear my head. Better, that is, until the kids came out of their hiding place. There was a little girl, her clothes tattered and worn, her face covered in filth, a look in her eyes that spoke volumes of the things she had witnessed. She was a stark contrast to Boise. He was clean and seemed almost calm. His eyes gave nothing away. Considering the circumstances they now found themselves in, it was actually a little unnerving. Along with the little girl was a set of twins. Two boys, both with albinism. It was hard not to notice it. My eyes may have lingered just a fraction of a moment too long. They were a few years older than the little girl for sure, and... I silently wondered if they could see very well. And the female in the group, who trudged into the clearing moments before, obviously took offense to my too long glance and started in on Boise. Who the hell is this? Why are you giving away our location? She hissed, obviously unimpressed. Boise explained very matter-of-factly that I was injured and knew the area, and in a condescending tone, declared... This is why we scout. His demeanor was very militant. I'm assuming he was a soldier of some kind. For me, it's just all the more reason to mistrust him. The governments have done nothing to stop the pandemonium of the last few years, so... Fuck Boise. Fuck whoever sent him here. Anyway, the woman did not appreciate his response and told him so. So, not only do you bring a stranger to camp you may have known for all of a few minutes, he's planning on using our valuable first aid supplies? What the fuck, Boise? She yelled. Caught a strong whiff of mama bear on this one. Clearly protective of the cubs. What does she even have to offer us? She questioned accusingly. 
She was also dirty, had tattered clothes, and seemed more than a little stressed. She knows the area. It'll be a lot easier to find supplies with someone who knows the place, Boise said, doing his utmost to keep the peace. I interjected then, introducing myself, trying to relieve some of the ever-building tension, but it didn't pan out that way. I don't give a fuck about your name, actually, Mama Bear replied as I offered it. Non-hostile my ass, right? Uh, I'll just be on my way then. You guys can relocate if you think it's best, and I'll leave now so you have plenty of daylight left, I said, turning to go. Mama, please stay. We need your help. The little girl had spoken. Quiet, Lucy, Mama Bear shouted. We do not need anyone's help. But she's the one. She can help bring an end to you. Don't you see it? The little girl argued. So that was definitely my cue to exit. I turned heel and told them that this whole situation was too fucked up for me, and I obviously had caused some tension, which is never good for the group. I started out, dreading the next few kilometers on my damn prosthetic. Rana, you're not going anywhere. Come get the supplies you need. Boise said. I'll apologize on Chantel's behalf. You haven't done anything wrong. She's... Shut the fuck up, Boise. You don't speak for me. The woman, or Chantel, I mean, interjected. Yeah, she's a real peach, that one. I'm giving Rana the supplies, Boise said, usurping Chantel's alpha posturing by staring her down as he uttered the words while rummaging through their pack. Chantel just glared at him. She decided not to continue to fight in front of the company, I guess, and uh, took the kids deeper into the woods. I imagined it was where their shelter was, since in the clearing we'd arrived in there was little more than a few logs positioned for sitting and a bit of food that had been left charring over some embers. I sat on one of the logs. A little sad the kids were being forced to leave, since I thought if I could make myself interesting to them, I could perhaps win over Chantel, but obviously now was not the time. Boise pulled out the supplies, handed over a tensor bandage, cleaning swabs, and a giant swath of cotton. I was lucky enough to have just a little ointment left that I had found a while back. I only used it when I absolutely had to, and it appeared I would require the last of it this time pissed at the prospect of having to try to find more. Your limp says you have a lot of work ahead of you, Boise said. I was annoyed by this comment, so I went as quickly as I could. I don't like people to know about my leg. It's perceived as a weakness. I am not weak. I rolled up my pant leg, took off my prosthetic, cleaned the now raw skin under and around it, used my ointment, patted the cotton around before wrapping the tensor to hold it all in. Put my leg back on and stood up. Boise was staring at me, mouth agape. What the fuck? exclaimed Boise. How the hell do you get yourself a brass leg? How the fuck is that any of your concern, Boise? I retorted immediately regretting it. He did not have to help me, and he risked his group dynamic to do so. Now I was acting like an asshole. (laughs) I apologized, shaking my head, and I gave Boise my thanks, offering him directions to the nearest place he could re-up on supplies. I told him I'd be more than happy to help with the kids if they needed to do more meaningful scouting or supply runs. He told me Chantel may not be a fan of that idea. I took that as my cue to tell him that it was obviously time for me to go. He protested only a little, clearly trying to build or maintain some sort of rapport. I didn't tell him where to find me only that the area we met was one I frequented and that he was bound to run into me there again if he went back. 
I took my leave and started back down the trail. I wish it could have been as simple as me just going back home after this unexpected encounter, but I couldn't risk it. I couldn't expose such an important location to a group of people I had no trust in whatsoever. Plus, there was another member of their party I hadn't even met yet. For all I knew, Chantel had asked the second male in their group to follow me, so I needed a place to crash and I needed some time to ensure they would get sick of following me and decide I was a homeless no one searching for scraps. So I just wandered. I'd been cooking food, I found in the basement of an abandoned house, and I used my compound bow to shoot a rabbit for dinner. All in all, I just avoided going anywhere near my actual camp. It's too crucial to my survival to give up so carelessly, so here I am, camping without supplies in an abandoned, half-burnt-down farm shed, looking conspicuous as hell, but not willing to stray to my actual home. My home since the fires, anyway. I didn't notice anyone following me, but then again, I don't spend a lot of time worrying about that sort of thing. Most of the time, I just hide where I know it's safe. I don't know for sure if I got all the details down. I don't even know if this recorder's still working or not. It's got no lights or anything. I just, I won't have any access to power till I get home and I won't be able to upload until I get there as well. So when you hear this, if you hear this, it'll already be days later. I don't know what'll happen between then and now. I don't even know if anyone will ever find these recordings or what I, worst case I'll just continue to store the day's events until somebody finds them but I I doubt every day in my life will be worth immortalizing but this encounter with this group today was worth it because I can't forget Lucy's words to me that I'm the one that I can bring an end to it what the fuck is that supposed to mean is, is it just the ramblings of a traumatized child I don't even know if the story Boise told me is true like why the fuck would anyone go cannibal what the actual fuck is that and a group, no less. Uh, I'm not sure I buy it. In any life or death situation, I guess it's not out of the realm, but honestly, so many people evacuated their homes, leaving everything behind. It's been a few years, but I haven't run out of food or supplies yet. Why would anyone ever be so desperate? I'm getting really tired. I'm rambling. I I think I might have to just head home. I need to be inside. Smoke's getting to my head. I'll record the next time something comes up with Boise's camp or the next time someone wants to keep their kids entertained with a story. Over and out, I guess. Whatever that means. My friends alone in the fire.